right, let's see how fast we can get through these. Uh, we've got an object drop from rest from the top of a 400 meter cliff on Earth. If air resistance is negligible, what is the distance the object travels during the first six seconds of its fall? Uh, really, unless it's hitting the ground, which it totally won't if you got a 400 meter cliff, uh, this is just there to distract you. We just want to know how something will fall in four seconds. Uh, it was dropped, so its initial velocity is zero. Uh, so uh, it's just d equals v i t plus one half a t squared. Our initial velocity is zero because it was dropped. And then uh, we want our displacement. It's going to be one half 10 um, times six squared. And then <clears throat> if we want to do that, it would be, I'd probably do the six squared first, 36 divided by two. Uh, 18 times 10, we got 180. Bam. All right, uh, 24, position of an object given by the equation. But by the way, anytime you got a polynomial like this, pretty good chance you're doing calc. Uh, we got a position uh, equation and we want acceleration. Acceleration is not the rate of change of position, it's the rate of change of velocity, which is itself the rate of change of the position. So we need to take two derivatives. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, so our velocity is equal to the derivative with respect to time of three t squared plus 1.5 t plus 4.5. Uh, we're gonna lose our constant right away because secretly there's a t to the zero right there. This t to the zero is one. Um, <clears throat> So we just got to worry about these two. So we take away one from our exponent, t to the one, and our new coefficient is our, our old coefficient times our old exponent. Uh, so six. And then uh, for this guy, 1.5, it's 1.5 t to the one. So that'll become t to the zero, which is just one. And then um, our new coefficient is 1.5. Um, basically, it, it'll end up being t to the zero. Uh, and then our new coefficient is 1.5 times one, which is just 1.5. And of course, t to the zero is just one. So that is good too. Uh, our acceleration is our rate of change or our derivative of velocity. So we just do the derivative again, 6t. And uh, this is t to the one. Hopefully at this point you can, maybe not, you might not have had enough practice to just be like, hey, if it's something times t, uh, you just end up with a constant. Our acceleration will just be six. Uh, <clears throat> using the formula, it would be, our new exponent would be to the zero, and then our new coefficient would be six times one, uh, which would be six. t to the zero is just one, so we can ignore it. Ta-da! And that's that sucker. Oh, no, I guess we gotta finish it off. Uh, we wanna know the acceleration of the object at three. Uh, if it's a constant six, your acceleration is always six. It doesn't matter if it's three seconds or three billion, um, assuming your formula is very, very accurate after three billion years or three billion seconds. All right, uh, 25. Student is testing the kinematics equations for uniformly accelerated motion by measuring the time it takes for a lightweight plastic ball to fall from the floor. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, the student predicts the time to fall using g is 9.8 meters per second squared, but they find the measured time to be longer. I mean, you're dropping ping pong balls or something. Uh, what's probably causing the error? Uh, do you think the acceleration of gravity is 70% greater at this location? Um, not unless you're on a different planet that's heavier or denser. Um, is the acceleration less than 9.8 at this location? Uh, not unless you are way high up in the air and not accelerating and somehow not falling to earth. Maybe if you're in an elevator falling down or slowing down from going up. Uh, would air resistance increase the downward acceleration? Uh, I haven't seen air resistance shove me down faster, so probably not that. Um, 
I would say the acceleration of plastic balls is not uniform. So it's not constantly 9.8. It would probably be 9.8 initially because your drag force from air uh, depends on your velocity. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so it would be D. You've got some drag forces and they're screwing stuff up. And who cares if the balls are spherical? It's air resistance. All right, uh, this sucker, I'm just gonna give you kind of like a hand wavy explanation for. Uh, you're launching something and um, we want it to travel as far as possible. And so to figure this out, I'm gonna tell you that if you're on flat and we're ignoring air resistance and all that, the ideal angle to maximize your distance is 45 degrees. If you fire something at 45 degrees, you're, you perfectly balance uh, your vertical component, which gives you more time in the air, and your horizontal component, which lets you make use of the time in the air by going faster every second. However, if you're launching from a cliff, uh, you already got some bonus time. So you're better off kind of uh, angling down a bit so you've got more velocity so you're, you're taking advantage of the extra time. You're up in the air for a while anyway. The way I really like to do these situations is I like to think of the most extreme absurd case. Uh, let's say we had a bottomless pit here. Uh, in that case, we wouldn't care about adding extra time at all by angling it up. We'd just aim it horizontally um, to maximize its horizontal displacement. Um, yeah, so it will be greater than zero, but less than 40, or sorry, yeah, greater than zero, but less than 45 degrees above the horizontal. Because it'd be 45 if you had uh, no elevation, and uh, the deeper it gets, the closer it gets to zero. And it'll hit zero if it is infinitely deep. All right, uh, so we got some vehicle accelerating the straight road at a rate of four meters per second squared for five seconds. What's the speed of the vehicle at the end of the time interval? Four times five. It would be, assuming, yeah, it started from rest. Uh, so 20. It's not so bad. Uh, what's the total distance the vehicle travels during this time? Uh, it went from 0 to 20, uh, so on average it was going 10 meters every second, because 10 is the middle between 0 and 20. Um, so uh, it went for 5 seconds, so 10 times 5 is 50. Because it was going average velocity of 10 meters per second for 5 seconds, 10 times 5. All right, uh, an object's thrown vertically upward in a region where the acceleration of gravity is constant, air resistance is negligible, and speed is recorded from the moment it leaves the thrower's hand until it reaches the maximum height. Uh, we just want a speed versus time graph. Uh, you want something with a slope down. Um, if you were to measure the slope, it should be 9.8, uh, 9.8 down. Uh, and at its maximum height, your initial, velo like your vertical velocity will go to zero. So it should be zero at the end. So all of these guys fail that test um, because at the maximum height, your velocity is zero. Anyway, answer is C. The air resistance is negligible. The speed of a two kilogram spear that falls from rest through a vertical displacement of 0.2 meters is most nearly, uh, we don't care about this because we're not doing dynamics. Um, it's basically just, uh, again, D equals VIT plus one half AT squared. We got some 0 0.2 meter cliff. Um, <clears throat> if it was dropped, if it falls, falls from rest, uh, this is just zero. And so we got 0 0.2 equals one half 10 times T squared, because we're using 10 instead of 9.8. Um, so if we go and multiply this around, uh, we got 0 0.04 equals T squared, where if you take the square root of this sucker, it should be 0 0.2. Uh, so T equals 0 0.2. Mm. Oh, 
I might screw something up. So this is the time it, it falls for, uh, but if we want to find our velocity, velocity is acceleration times time. Uh, so it would be 10 meters per second squared times 0 0.2 seconds. Um, there's no initial velocity, uh, so it's just two. Whoop. Alrighty, last two questions. Projectiles launched from level ground with initial speed V naught and mangle with the horizontal. Air resistance is negligible. How long will the projectile remain in the air? Uh, basically, it's change in velocity over acceleration. So you know how like acceleration equals change in velocity over time? We can trade these suckers, moving things diagonally across the equal sign, and we got time equals change in velocity over acceleration. Uh, something we got excited about um, in the first semester of this year. Um, and our change in velocity is basically our down velocity minus our up velocity um, over our acceleration. And in this case, our down velocity is going to be a V naught sine theta. So we're going from like, um, let's make down positive because that'll work better. So it ends up, we're at V naught sine theta at the end of it all. And then we're gonna subtract, it was going up initially, so we'll make that negative. I've decided up is negative and down is positive because uh, for this question, it'll work out nicely. Uh, it works either way. It's just, uh, yeah. Yeah, so remember it would start off with V naught sine theta of upward momentum and what, if it's coming back to the same height, whatever you throw something up, uh, it's got the same velocity down at the end. Uh, over A or two V naught sine theta over A. Nice little trick. So that's what we're looking for. And we got it. And then the last sucker. Oh, and it's not easy. Whatever. Uh, so you've got some object of unknown mass initially at rest. When we drop it from height H, it reaches the ground with velocity V1. The same object is then raised the same height H, but this time it's thrown downward with velocity V1. And then it now reaches the ground with velocity V2. How is V2 related to V1? This is made a whole lot easier if you think that, hey, going from like zero, you got some height to V1, and then you bring it back to the same height, V1 to V2. That's the same as dropping something off a cliff that's twice height, like uh, two times the original height. So it goes from zero at the halfway point half distance point, it's at V1, and then at the end, it's at V2. So if we wanna know how V2 is related to V1, V1 would be, um, V1, if we use uh, VF squared equals VI squared plus two AD, where VI squared is just zero, because we're starting there, and D is H and two H, um, v i squared or v one squared um, or why don't we just do v one it's going to equal two a h whereas v two ooh, root two a h would equal two a two h because it fell twice as far effectively um, and then we can just pull that out Pull out this two, so V2 equals root two, root two A H, um, or V2. Uh, so if you think about it, this is just V1, so V2 equals root two, V2, root two times V1. 
Perfect. All right. If you watched it all, you are amazing. Anyway, thanks for working through this, guys. Catch you next time.